so I'm going to be talking uh, broadly about uh, one project in particular, but then how it connects to my broader interests in uh, research transparency. So let's get started. Um, and I'm going to be talking to you about the Health Inequality Project. And really, just to orient us, um, I think one of the things that makes this both an interesting and challenging thing to study, I'm going to switch actually. Turn off this mic. Here we go. So I think one of the things that makes health inequality both interesting and challenging to study is the bi-directional relationship between socioeconomic status and health. And so, you know, among the many risks we all face, developing an illness is just a very human risk. Many of us do it at different points in our lives. Um, and, you know, just as one example, about half of Americans will develop a new chronic condition in their 50s. And that's true independent of whether they had prior chronic health conditions. So we all face the risk of illness. And illness is more likely for people with lower socioeconomic status. Illness is also a source of lower socioeconomic status. So illnesses cause long-term income losses. And that's been documented not just here in the US, but in the Netherlands, it's in Denmark, in the US, in Canada. And so not only is health a source of economic risk, but health is also highly unequal across socioeconomic groups and geographic areas. Uh, and so in work that I've done, we documented that the richest Americans, people in the top 1% of the income distribution, are living 10 to 15 years longer than the poorest Americans, while life expectancy varies very substantially across areas. So if you look across areas in the US, not all areas look the same. And so, Today, I'm going to be talking to you a little bit about the Health Inequality Project, which is an ongoing project where me and my collaborators are examining inequality and longevity in the United States. And I think the reason I'm here talking to you about this project is because this is really the project that launched my work on reproducible social science. And so I'm going to spend really the first, maybe third of this presentation talking to you about this paper and telling you about what we found, about the work we, we did on the association between income and life expectancy in the United States. And in the second half, second two thirds of the talk, I'm really going to start to draw the connection between uh, this work and reproducible social science and sort of explain the mechanisms behind why it is that you can go on our website, go on GitHub, download the code, download a zip file, write like three uh, commands and run the whole uh, pr program from start to finish. So I'm going to start with just like an introduction to the research. So you know what it is we did. Uh, and so there were basically four research questions that we tried to answer in one paper. Uh, the first was how large are those gaps in life expectancy between rich and poor Americans? And then natural second corollary is how are those gaps evolving over time? How have things changed if you look 20 years ago compared to today, or in this case, 2014, we're still working on, we've got some newer research that I won't be presenting today. Um, and then we started to unpack a little bit of evidence around the why. So one question is like, how does longevity and inequality in longevity vary between different areas of the US? How does it differ here in San Francisco compared to West Virginia, compared to Florida, compared to Massachusetts? And then what are the local factors that just descriptively, what do the places where people live long lives look like? Uh, we're not going to present causal evidence in this paper. I'm not going to tell you that here's one neat trick to increase people's life expectancy. But there are some clear descriptive characteristics that the places with these characteristics tend to have longer lives for low income Americans. And so in this project, we were using de-identified data from tax records covering the entire US population from 1999 to 2014. And so that totals up 1.4 billion observations, person year observations. And that really allows us to bring a magnifying glass to relationships that people had already explored, but hadn't been able to explore in such granularity. And so really do a granular analysis of the relationship between income and mortality. And then this, you know, once we have this data, we get to work characterizing life expectancy by income over time and across areas. 
And so I think this project has really two contributions to the literature. One is more precise estimates at the national level. So we can really look at income percentiles. We can look at income percentiles in different states. Um, and so the second part is this local area estimation, where if you're working with survey data, it's really impossible to drill down to individual counties, individual commuting zones, what's going on in San Francisco versus Los Angeles. Um, but really, we're able to see substantial variation in the level and the change in life expectancy across areas and see that that variation is especially large for the poor. So just to preview, one of the takeaways of our project is that if you're rich, it matters much less where you live than if you're poor here in the United States. Yes. So we have a, you know, we have a variety of definitions. We measure uh, life expectancy at the state level, at the commuting zone level, which are aggregations of counties that correspond to, you know, if you looked at the different counties, say, in the San Francisco area, there are a bunch of counties where people tend to, you know, live and work in across these county lines. And so commuting zones aggregate up these counties into larger areas that you can think of as like a local labor market. And then we can go down to the county level as well. Of course, the challenge is the finer you go, the more places we're going to lose because they just don't have enough population to provide a precise measure of life expectancy. So if you want the full pop, you know, not all commuting zones have estimates, not all counties have estimates because some are just very sparsely populated. And so, you know, not all of us in the room are health researchers. Let me introduce you to something that we all read about, like we're all, you will see in the news, discussions of life expectancy. Life expectancy is a really weird measure. Uh, it's a very strange concept. It sounds very intuitive. The life expectancy that you would typically think of is a cohort life expectancy. Someone born in 1990, what is their, the expected age at which they will die? What is the mean uh, age at death? for someone born in 1990 or in 1940. And that previews the fact that for someone born in 1990, we have no idea what their cohort life expectancy is because at this point, they're 33. They have many years of life ahead, typically, and we don't know what will transpire, whether there will be more pandemics, what kind of progress will be made against cancer, against heart disease, et cetera. And so, you know, if you're reading about cohort life expectancies, you're typically talking about people born in 1940 or earlier. What we're usually talking about with life expectancy is period life expectancy, which is this hypothetical person who experiences the mortality rate at each age observed across the population in a given year. So the period life expectancy for the year 2023 is take somebody who's born, and say, okay, they have the mortality rate of zero-year-olds, one-year-olds, two-year-olds, three-year-olds, four-year-olds in 2023. The period life expectancy in 2020, if you saw a news article, said, oh, life expectancy fell by three years. That doesn't mean you're, you should expect to live three fewer years than you did before the COVID pandemic. That's somebody who experienced every year of their life in the worst timeline in 2020 would have had an expected longevity three years shorter. And so what we're going to do here, we're estimating uh, life expectancy conditional on an individual's income, gender, and local area at age 40. And so, for example, we're combining the mortality rates for everyone who was at the 25th income percentile in 2001 to obtain life expectancy at the 25th percentile. And so with this period life expectancy concept, it's different from a cohort life expectancy in two ways here. One, we're not thinking about like what will transpire in terms of medical innovations in the future, but we're also holding fixed someone's income in the future. So we're not accounting for what will transpire in terms of mean reversion or up, upward growth, downward growth in someone's income over time. So it's different from the sort of what you would think of as the most intuitive measure of a cohort life expectancy. Uh, and we're going to estimate this life expectancy using this data on raw mortality rates by age for each subgroup. And so I'm just going to take you on a whirlwind tour through the highlights of the paper. I'm not going to delve into all of the technical details of uh, how we estimate this estimate, but let's get straight to the juicy stuff. Let's get straight to the results. 
And so here I'm plotting the 100 income percentiles. So here we're only, in this paper, we're only able to measure people who have positive income. There's a large number of Americans who have zero income. We're just not able to measure them in this study. We're using tax data. We don't have an accurate measure of all the people who have zero income. So we're going to start with the people with the lowest income and then group them into 100 bins up to the people with the highest income. Here we're looking at men. Uh, starting at age 40, what is their mean longevity? What's the average uh, life expectancy? You can see in the top 1%, it's 87 years. In the bottom 1%, it's 72 years. So a 15-year gap in life expectancy between the richest and the poorest Americans in this 2001-2014 period. If you look at women, uh, you have a slightly smaller gap, but still a massive gap, about 10 years uh, between the richest and the poorest women. And so to put that in perspective, the gap in life expectancy between a lifetime smoker and a non-smoker it's about 10 years. And so we're talking about really big differences in longevity. And I think it's also worth thinking about how much media attention is given to income inequality in the United States. And the fact that this is so correlated means that people with low incomes are not just experiencing inequality in terms of you know, fewer opportunities to spend money, to have a comfortable life, but also just fewer years on this earth. And so if we just think about like welfare, this is an extremely important dimension of individual well-being. So let's think about how that's changed over the 15-year period we're studying. So here we're looking at the rate of change, that slope in life expectancy per year. And I'm splitting now just to get a little bit more precision. I'm splitting people into 20 groups. So you have the top 5% is that last dot on the right. The bottom 5% is this first dot on the left. And I think the first thing to observe is that there's absolutely no gain in life expectancy for the bottom income group over the last 14 years. And if you look sort of above median, there's a pretty substantial gain of about um, 0.1 life years per year. So over the course of a 10 year period, they've gained a year of expected longevity, uh, while at the bottom, there's been no gains. This is for men. There have been no gains in life expectancy for women either. And so not only are there these large gaps, but those gaps are growing over time. Things aren't getting worse for anyone, but things are getting quite a bit better over time for rich Americans. And those gains are not translating for uh, low-income Americans. They're not shared. They're not distributed equally. And as we start to unpack this, let's think about what life expectancy looks like in different areas of the United States. So here are four cities. These are four carefully chosen cities to sort of reflect the uh, broad relationship, where what you can see is exactly what I previewed. For these above median income folks, life expectancy looks very similar, regardless of where you live. If you live in New York City, in San Francisco, in Dallas, in Detroit, in fact, in most places in America, life expectancy looks very similar for people in the top half of the income distribution. But in the bottom half of the income distribution, there's enormous variation across place, where people in New York City are living about five years longer than people in Detroit. And just that's just one, uh, I think, concrete way of visualizing something that's really broadly true across the entire country. If you look at just like a variance term, and I plotted the variance over uh, income, you would see much higher variance at the bottom income distribution than at the top. And that is, once again, as with all of the trends I'm describing, it's true for both men and women in the United States. So the final section of this paper really seeks to provide some descriptive evidence of why does life expectancy vary across areas? And you know, we'd love to give you a causal story where you know here is the thing you need to change in order to make you know, life expectancy look everywhere like it does in New York City, or perhaps even better. We don't have that causal story. I'm going to give you a correlational study. So I'm going to characterize the features of areas with high or low life expectancy conditional on income without telling you it's not that, in fact, it's not even that if you gave people more money that their life expectancy would track along that curve. Because as we started with the beginning, there are many factors that are, you know, there's both this bi-directional relationship where one of the reasons that people have uh, low income is because they're in poor health, 
but also there are many like third factors. There are just many uh, sources of endogeneity in this relationship. So let's start with one where really we don't need to question the causal pathway. There's an enormous amount of scientific literature in the medical literature on the effects of smoking, obesity, exercise. Um, these are factors that have causal relationships with uh, health and longevity. And sure enough, they're strongly correlated with uh, the life expectancy of individuals in the bottom quartile of the income distribution. So we started with these health behaviors because the literature has identified them as important. And then we explored a variety of other factors that the literature has broadly discussed as being potentially important for people's longevity. Starting with smoking, one thing that I think stands out is this correlation is so strong, you can just see it visually on a map. So here's the map of smoking rates uh, by commuting zone for the bottom income quartile. Here's a map of life expectancy for men and for women. And so if you sort of just like flip through these, obviously they're not exactly the same, but you can just see that like 0.7 correlation visually shows up on the map. Now, as we started to explore other factors, there are a variety of factors that are discussed in the literature that really don't seem to stand out as describing a lot of the variation. So it's not that these things, we can't rule out that these things matter, but if they matter, they're not uh, describing the overall descriptive variation that we see uh, across the country. And so one thing that you might ask is like, what about health insurance? Uh, the rate of, uh, of uninsured Americans in each uh, local area is not strongly correlated with life expectancy in the bottom income quartile. If you look at the amount of Medicare spending, again, not so much. Um, one thing that people have wondered is like, is the Gini coefficient is just inequality itself bad for people's health. And you're going to see, you can find a lot of uh, discussion in this literature that just inequality is bad for you. Um, having more uh, variation, larger gaps between rich and poor in income is bad for people's health. And it turns out we really don't find any evidence of that. If anything, um, the places like Gini, the Gini coefficient is not strongly correlated with uh, with the life expectancy of people in the bottom of the income distribution, if anything, it's positively correlated. Places with higher Gini indexes have higher longevity, not statistically significant. Why is that? Because this is like something that actually surprises people. It is a robust finding. And the reason is actually kind of mechanical. It has to do with the fact that the relationship between income and longevity is convex, which means that the first $10,000 matter a lot more than, you know, going from $10,000 to $20,000 matters a lot more than going from $200,000 to $210,000. And so places with a lot of inequality have a lot of really rich people and really poor people. And those really rich people don't have so much higher longevity than like middle class people. They have a little bit higher longevity, but not very much. And so as you, this is actually like, for those who have uh, studied it, this is just Jensen's inequality in action, or the triangle inequality in action. As you spread people out further across the income distribution, you have more low income and more high income people, the average goes down, not because inequality is directly harming the longevity of low income people, we, we really don't see any evidence of that, just that the average of a convex function uh, is lower than the uh, value in the middle. And so that was one of the findings of our study. We look at uh, the index for social capital. We look at local labor market conditions. Really, none of these uh, broadly discussed factors seem strongly correlated. There is one other set of features that seems to really pop out. In addition to health behaviors, it seems like these measures of local affluence seem to matter a lot. So the places where immigrants in America choose to live and to have uh, higher life expectancy, places with higher median home values, local government expenditures, higher population density, more college graduates. These are all these are all univariate correlations, and all of these things are correlated with one another. So I think of these as a cluster of characteristics that describe certain places, that describe places like New York City, that describe places like San Francisco, where it seems like low-income Americans are living longer lives. And so my takeaways 
and then I'll, I'll take a couple questions. One is that inequality in life expectancy in the United States is large and it's growing, but it doesn't seem to be immutable. Not every area of the United States looks the same. It isn't some feature of the US as a country that just, you know, on average does not look like its peer countries in the world. There are actually some areas in the US that have relatively small gaps and have shrinking gaps in life expectancy. I think one of the implications of that finding is that there isn't some one size fits all policy that would solve this problem across the United States. We really have to think locally when we're thinking about people's health. So reducing health disparities is likely to require local policy interventions because the situation on the ground varies so much across local areas. And one implication is that health behaviors at the local level are likely to be important. Yes, you had a question. Yeah, I just, I just have a basic question in terms of the variables that we just like. Yes. Um, were these somehow pre-specified or you went into the data and you saw which ones were already? So they were not pre-specified, but one of the things we did in terms of transparency is that we ran a, a, a larger set than shows up in this table. And that larger set is both in the appendix and all of the underlying data to run the correlations is publicly available. And so to the extent that you know, we're transparent, that we are showing a selected set and doing our interpretation of that selected set, we're trying to, in the paper itself, tell the story that we found meaningful, while also giving others the ability to sort of check our work, both you know, okay, here are the, all the other things we looked at that we didn't report in the paper. You can look at them yourselves. And also it's available for other people to do their own correlations with really anything they could, anything that is measured at the county or the commuting zone or the state level can be done. And other people actually have, many people have downloaded this data and done that work. Yes. So it's about 10%. And in more recent work, we're working to include those people. So in more recent work, we've, so this database is really built off of the income tax records. More recent work, we've been trying to build our database off of uh, census records, which will incorporate people who have no income but respond to the census. There's a much smaller number of people who don't respond to the census than the number of people who have zero income. And so, uh, it's still, you know, it's still not perfect. It, it's, there are going to be populations of unhoused people, for example, who are not as responsive to the census, but the census is a, their job is to enumerate Americans and they do a pretty good job at it. And so um, that's where we're working now to really expand and document, uh, characterize the situation for the lowest income Americans. Yeah. So this is conditional on reaching age 40. And the reason why is because we need a measure of adult income in order to do the method that we're studying. One thing that would be really interesting would be to ask, what is the expected life expectancy of a child, maybe at birth, conditional on the income of their parents? And that is just data that we don't yet have available. The people who's, for whom we have linkages between parental income and children, they just haven't lived long enough for us to really characterize their longevity. I'd say like wait 30 years and the US will have enough data. It's possible that you could do that with some Scandinavian countries data. But um, that sort of question I think would be fascinating, but is not yet uh, is not yet possible to answer using administrative data in the US. Yes. Um, so you said that uh, for instance, my dog, um, they could need to have more diversity. They have Uh, the life expectancy uh, is, is bigger. Um, so, but the city is one of the problems is that the uh, problems like air pollution and water contamination, um, those be, uh, these are the factors that could have an impact, an adverse impact on life expectancy. Mm -hmm. So, could you uh, consider these factors uh, while excluding the study? Yeah, one of the, so it very indirectly in that one of the things we looked at was income segregation. So we asked whether one theory is that in places where rich Americans and poor Americans live separately, often rich Americans have better amenities. So they'll be living in a leafy green suburb with good air quality, 
lower temperatures, while lower income people might be exposed to industrial pollutants, have worse air quality, higher crime. There are like many factors that might be associated with segregation, right? Here I'm talking about income-based segregation. There are many forms of segregation, but the one that would be relevant here would be income segregation. And by contrast, places that are very integrated, where rich people and poor people live side by side in the same neighborhoods, you would think that would be associated potentially with smaller gaps. And we don't really find strong evidence of that. And that isn't to say that pollution doesn't matter. Pollution definitely matters, but it's just, it's not the factor that's explaining the variation over across areas that we see. So there's a ton of really interesting research on the like causal effects of air pollution or industrial chemicals on harming people's health. And I don't want to discount that at all. I think that's very important. One thing that there are clearly countervailing factors because the people who are living in dense uh, areas with expensive homes, you know, there are many things that are hard about living in dense areas with expensive homes. Um, on average, the people with low incomes that are living longer. And I also don't want to like oversell the causal interpretation there. One potential story is that being rich in, sorry, having low income in New York City or Los Angeles or San Francisco is very different from having low income in Tulsa, Oklahoma or Birmingham, Alabama. The people who have chosen to live in a dense and expensive city, um, when they don't have high incomes, maybe they're on a sharp upward trajectory. And so there's selection there too. The, it, one thing with immigrants is that people born in the United States uh, have a place they were born into. They were either they were born in a big city or they were born in a rural area. Immigrants are often have some choice over where they choose to settle in the United States. And so they may choose to settle in places that are better for them in some dimension. There's a lot of selection into where people live that's going to be picked up in these sorts of studies. Yes. Here you have a huge sample size, but also you go very, very granular. Yeah. At some point, you need to draw a line, right, and say, we, you mentioned there's some uh, census tracts that you don't say anything. Is, is that when, when you draw a line, is it supposed to be informed by power calculation? How, how do you, do, do you talk about that? That's a great question. So, in this paper, it's informed by signal and noise calculations. So ex post, it's not like in advance we specified this is just descriptive data. We weren't running an experiment. So once we had the data, we asked, what is the signal variation? What's the noise variation? And how is that associated with population? So one of the figures that actually doesn't make it into the paper, um, it isn't even an appendix figure in the paper, but it is in the replication kit. And so if you download that replication kit and you download the data and you run the code, there are figures there where you will see on the x-axis is the local population. On the y-axis is the signal standard deviation or the signal to noise ratio. And then we made a subjective judgment where we have to make a subjective choice of at certain point, there's so much noise that this adds so little value to people's information, it's just adding splotches on the map. And so let's not publish it. Um, obviously, the I think the data to generate the life expectancies for those groups is probably actually still in the data set. But when we publicize our data, there's actually a, a choice where we think we do more harm than good by making it easy to study those places. And I, to be honest, I've reviewed papers that say, oh my God, there's like 50 year differences in life expectancy between this tiny area of the US and that tiny area of the US, which unless you do some sort of uh, you know, Bayesian shrinkage, unless you do some sort of noise adjustment, you're just gonna pick up noise and that some people died in this area and this year. And, not very many people died in that area, and it's going to change next year. And so I think that sort of uh, statistical signal calculation is really important. OK. So for any of you who is like really interested in this topic and, and would love to like hear more, obviously, there are academic papers. I personally love listening to podcasts a lot. And there's a recent podcast that just came out the beginning of this year. Uh, from the Stanford Center on, on Longevity called Century Lives. And really this entire season of this podcast is about the topic that I was just describing to you. So they did something that I thought was 
really valuable and not something that in my discipline I do, which is that they they went to these places. They actually went to Birmingham, Alabama. They went to a low-income Hispanic community on the border between Texas and Mexico. And they spoke to people and they uh, learned a little bit about what life is like in these places that are where people are living long and healthy lives. Uh, so I find it really interesting to listen to. Um, it's sort of like the uh, a very different form of data analysis, uh, but um, from like honestly, a, a podcast based on my paper would not be nearly as interesting as this podcast. So, any of you who are interested in this topic, I highly recommend it. Yes. I like that. Uh, can you ask you uh, if you are kind of doing this method? You are definitely doing that. Is that if you don't have a topic, you are doing it in the public? Well, I don't think that the I think these methods are complements, not substitutes. I don't think you could get the results of my study using this kind of um, go into the community and learn about things. There are too many communities in the US. You know, I can, you know, pull up a server and crunch the numbers for thousands of counties, sending in graduate students or uh, really skilled podcast hosts to interview people in a thousand counties. It's just not <laughs> find me the grant money to do that because I don't have it. Um, and but one thing that our research did is that I think it informed the places where they went. So we saw lo longevity for low income people in Birmingham, Alabama was growing very significantly. So they went to Birmingham, Alabama and they spoke to people and they said, what's going on in this community? And some people said, oh, we don't know. And some people said, I think it's this. And so I think these things are compliments, not substitutes. Yes. Um, I just wondered if there's any sort of like hypotheses, I guess, in literature as to why the back curves, the curves you were showing up in some slide are maybe public domain, uh, or if that's just like a. That's a, a good observation. So I think you would want to speak to someone who's not an economist about that, because one thing that it, that I know is true is that this relationship where women live longer than men is true across species. So it's not just for humans. We know that women have higher life expectancy than men, but in general, female, uh, you know, females across many species have longer life expectancies than males of the same species. And the fact that that's true, I think clearly has some sort of biological uh, uh, story. Part of it is the fact that two X chromosomes have more information than a Y chromosome, which is missing, literally has less information, and that can be protective, but that's not the whole story. So like, you know, I'm not the right person to explain the biological factors. One thing that's interesting is that when you then look by income, there's this flatter slope. And I think relating that biology to like, why would that, is that more protective for people at the bottom of the income distribution? It's a really interesting and intriguing question. It's something we sort of write a single sentence about in the paper, but I think I'm, I'm not personally well equipped to get the scientific answer. Yes. So this paper, which was published in 2016, is through 2014. The work, the ongoing work um, using census data extends now to 2022. And so uh, that work is not yet published. We're uh, active, it's one of the things uh, I'm gonna be working on next week when I get back to Boston. Um, but that's a project where we're going to be, one of the things we can do is bring in data on self-reported racial identification on people's self uh, on people's census responses, as well as looking at the effects of the pandemic, uh, and it turns out those both of those uh, additional dimensions of data are really interesting, and I'm looking forward to publishing work on that. Yep. Yeah, so I can tell you just like descriptively, because I have been looking at this data, there's basically this inflection point around 2011, where in 20, before 2011, so like 2000 to 2011, you sort of had this rising tide lifting all boats, where everyone's life expectancy was improving. And actually for many low-income Americans, uh, life expectancy was growing faster for, um, than for high-income Americans. You see this reversal in 2011, which is correlated with the outbreak of the opioid epidemic 
but uh, there are other things going on probably as well. Uh, opioids cannot solely explain what's going on, but you see a reversal where life expectancy starts to fall for low-income Americans. Um, and that those differ by location, they differ by uh, racial group, but uh, there's this clear reversal that lasts from 2011 to 2019, and then like inequality explodes in the pandemic, and we haven't seen it reconverge. So the pandemic hit low income, pe like people who were already worse off were much harder hit by COVID-19 than people who were already well off. And so uh, I think one of the current questions in the field of health inequality is just what's going to happen in the next few years once COVID-19 is not directly the source of deaths, it's still an indirect source of inequality in terms of reshaping economic activity, reshaping people's health. So lots of forms of preventive health uh, were things that people didn't access during the pandemic. And so seeing trends in cancer and heart disease and diabetes care that where people did not receive the care they needed over the course of 2020 to 2022, uh, this one time, one time, hopefully one time event uh, could have really long lasting impacts on inequality into the future, even if it's not directly from COVID-19 infections, which are still ongoing. So, okay. I think I underestimated your interest in uh, health inequality. So I thought that would be the first uh, third or half of the talk. We're three quarters of the way through the talk. Let me talk about reproducibility. So I guess you've heard a lot about reproducibility this this week, uh, week, and so um, maybe it's okay that I spend more time talking about health inequality. But you know, I've sort of previewed this data is available. Um, we have a website, healthinequality.org, where we write that we're committed to ensuring that our work and methodology is accessible and replicable by others. And so, one of the things we did was we published really formatted data tables. It's like here's a table. It's got a code book. It's really easy. If you want to do uh, secondary research with this data download one of these tables, they're easily accessible. In addition to that, um, all of the code that we wrote is released to the public domain under a permissive license, and all of the data required to run that code is public. And so on our GitHub page, we have an explanation of here's how we've organized our code. We start with the raw data. We run two, we've like sort of split our code into three pipelines for convenience, but Basically, if you download the raw data and the code, you run the initial pipeline, the data generation pipeline, you get all of the derived data. Uh, that sort of that can take hours or up to a day uh, on my 2014 laptop. It probably runs faster these days. Um, this last pipeline is just the, what turns through derived data and produces all the tables and figures and numbers in the paper and produces the results. And so there's like a clear descriptive explanation of like, Here's what you run. You run this one piece of code. Everything will be produced uh, to reproduce the entire paper. Um, so I think like documenting that was, you know, this was in 2016 we were doing this. I, there, as I'll describe in this presentation, there are things I would do differently today. But I think already we were doing a pretty good job of making the code and data accessible and reproducible. So you explain to people, not everyone even knows how to use GitHub. So it's like click the green button in the top right and you can download a big zip file uh, and unzip that somewhere on your computer. Or you know, if you're a Git user, just clone the repository however you like to clone repositories. Um, and then we say, okay, there are two, we actually provided two different data files that you can download. Um, the first option was just the like original data only file. So that's one gigabyte. And it actually has all of the raw data that you need to generate the results. But for a lot of people don't want to sit there and like have their laptops churn through all of the code to produce the results. They can, which is nice. That's good. That's a good sign of reproducibility. But if they don't want to, maybe they just want to download the derived results that we produced. And so we provide that as well. And that's really like help people out. If you want to see that figure that I described to you verbally, you could download the code and the raw data, or you could download the derived results and just open up the image file and see it. Uh, and so you can use that file to compare orig original results with replication output. And so, you know, it's, we describe how to configure Stata and run the code. And uh, I, my hypothesis is that if you did so, you would get the same results. And so thinking about reproducibility, I think one of the key requirements is that you need to have builds that really everyone can run. So if somebody else downloads your code and raw data, 
they will be able to run your code on the raw data to generate derived data and generate results that actually match what's in the paper and what's posted online. And if you were to delete your derived data and your results, you would obtain the exact same result that you had before. So it's not just other people that need to be able to reproduce your own work. You need to be able to reproduce your own work. That's like the, the starting point there. And so this is you know, surprising to some economists, but uh, when you're preparing the slides or the paper or the data release, the results on the folder in your computer actually need to match what would happen if you ran all of your code on the raw data. And so here is an example from the first project that I worked on as a young research assistant before I did a PhD. I was brought in, I was working with uh, analysis final, um, it's a 4,930 line uh, piece of uh, script for code, produces all of the figures for two separate papers. The paper was too long and the journal told them to split it into two. And so you could write, do analysis final and wait 10 hours and it would produce all of the results after 10 hours. Um, but in practice, we can't wait hours every time we needed new results. And so we're just going to rerun some snippets that need to be rerun. And inevitably, at some point, it would be a while since the code had been run from top to bottom. And we would ask ourselves, OK, why is it crashing now? And why are the results different from what I saw three weeks ago? That was like my nightmare question when I was a research assistant. It's like, why does this number look different from the number I saw three weeks ago? And I'm like, I don't know. We've changed a lot of things in this 4,900 line uh, script. I don't know which one changed that number. And so in practice, only someone who's working on the code full time can even aspire to understand the structure of that entire script and how all the pieces fit together. And even then, only with a lot of thinking, and even then, you're likely to make mistakes because it's just a Herculean task. So this is the code that you can download from GitHub for the project that I've been discussing today, which has even more code. It's 12,336 lines of code spread out across 78 files. And so the average file is about 158 lines of code. And now we've traded a, one problem for a different problem. So the question is, what order do these files need to be run in? And this is an example from a, very, from a different project, a very kind research assistant. I joined a project as a graduate research assistant. And I said, OK, how do I get started on this project? She said, OK, give me a day. I'm just going to I'm just going to make a map for you of, of how the code gets run. She like took a day and she produced this and she handed it to me. And she's like, here's how all the code is connected. Uh, and if you want to get one thing, like you run the things that are higher up in this flow chart. And I was like, thank you. Uh, it's too bad that she spent a whole day doing that. And hopefully it was correct. This is not the ideal way to organize your project. It's really, really hard. And so even in this case, when you have split up your code into many different components, OK, you can like run it and wait 10 hours, and the results are ready. But you need to know what order to run these files in and how they depend on one another. And once again, you can't wait hours every time you need new results. So you're just going to run individual pieces of this broader pipeline. And you're going to have the exact same problem, where it's been a while since the code ran from top to bottom, and you've just been editing all of the individual pieces and running them piecemeal. And you're going to ask yourself, why is it now crashing? Or why is this number different from what I saw three weeks ago? And it will once again be hard to answer that question. So the exact same problem arises, even once I think I, we've made some progress. We've gone from a like unmaintainable 4,900 line piece of code to like these code, pieces of code. I can understand any one of those files, but only someone who's working on the code full time can hope to understand that entire collection of do files and how those pieces fit together. And even then, they're likely to make mistakes. And so the claim that I make to my collaborators is that in any large scale coding project, Understanding the structure of the entire code base and how all those pieces fit together is not something we should be trying to do in our heads. We can give that job to computers. We can replace that part of our job with robots and be happy about it because they're better at it than we are. And then we can spend our time thinking interesting thoughts about the research rather than trying to figure out that uh, flow chart. And so, you know, I think 
in some ways, like here, I've got an interested audience. Most audiences actually aren't intrinsically interested in re reproducibility, but you're already sold on the concept. So my pitch is that automated build systems are really important. And so in practice, those do files, those research scripts, each one was short, focused, and self-contained. So by self-contained, I mean that short and focused is useful because it means that like anyone on your project, if it's like 100 lines, 200 lines, they can read that in a half hour. They can understand what that does without spending a month or two months, which is how long it took me to understand the giant uh, file. And self-contained is important too, because it means that it, a given piece of code is only going to be affected through the files that it loads, and it's only going to affect downstream code through the files it saves. And that gives you structure. That means that there aren't these side effects where, oh, if you change the name of a variable in this code, it's actually going to change the regressions that are run in this other piece of code because we read in this list from this file. And, and suddenly, by changing one thing in one place, you've surprisingly, you didn't know it, but now you've changed something somewhere else. So if everything only affects the rest of the code through the files it loads and the files it saves, then it's actually easy for you and the computer to keep track of where are the potential downstream consequences. So as we write our code, we actually tell the automated build system which files our code is loading and saving. And we tell the automated build system what order to run them in. And then it's going to take care of a lot of things. So with those two inputs, the automated build system can build the entire project from top to bottom. It can also, rather than waiting that full hours, days, sometimes weeks, depends on your project, rather than waiting to run the whole thing from top to bottom every time, you can just check which files have changed since the last build and rerun the portions of the code that depend on changed files. It could build the project twice and ensure the results match. Ideally, there isn't something stochastic in your code where every time you run the code, you get something slightly different. If there is, you will need to set the seed and, and handle that, but it's pretty easy to just build it twice, see if you get the same results. And it'll tell you if your build doesn't make sense. So sometimes if you're just doing things manually, you'll end up like loading a data set before the code that creates it. Uh, and so the file doesn't exist or it does exist, but only because you've run the code in like various orders that uh, are not the order that you intended. So it'll tell you like, hey, you're trying to load a file that actually gets produced later in your, in your code base. And so finally, for any file, it can actually tell you where it was created in your code base and all of the places that then loaded in that are then affected by that file. And choosing an automated build tool, you're, you're spoiled for choice. There are many different automated build tools. Uh, this might be, this is new to many researchers, but it's not new to computer scientists. The OG build tool, Make, was first written in 1976, and it's still used. There are economists who use it. I've seen uh, not many, but I've seen some papers that use Make. Um, in my work, I use a build tool called Project, which was designed for Stata by Robert Picard. And the reason I use this sort of domain-specific build tool is because the most challenging part of using a build tool is actually doing that process of correctly recording all the files that your code depends on or the files your code creates. Actually, that's like maybe a little bit generous. To, actually, the most challenging part is convincing your collaborators that it's worth spending time to record the files your code depends on or creates. And Project is by no means the most flexible, the most powerful, the most efficient build system. It's, it's none of those things. But on, for my purposes, it's actually the one that makes it easiest to record this information directly in the code and has made it easiest for the research assistants I work with and for the co-authors I work with to actually go about doing that. Now, if you're working in Stata and using Project, I recommend checking out a beta version that I've forked and made a variety of changes to the code that I find improve quality of life, give fewer errors that um, the, the OG version of Project um, will sometimes give you errors that you're like, ah, oh, I could have been more, I could have explained things more descriptively and then it wouldn't throw this error, but actually there's nothing wrong. And, um, and so anyway, there's a variety of changes there. But there are many other build tools. Like you don't need to do, use the exact same build tool that I use. One very modern, flexible, popular choice is called SCONS. Um, you can use it 
if you're using R, it's built in Python. You can, it's very popular with Python programming. You can use it if you're using Stata. In the end, I actually, I, I don't care what build tool you use. Um, I do think you should use a build tool. And using one is more important than which one you choose. You should use whichever one. You should choose whichever one you'll actually use. And you're ideally one that the other people working on the paper with you will also use. That's, I think, the, the biggest criterion in my books. And um, then you can get really deep in the weeds on like all of the different features of build tools. But having a build tool is better than not having a build tool. So let me conclude in the traditional style of a talk, which is talking about what I want to do in the future. So on the side of like research on health inequality, I have a variety of work that's trying to connect population health with economic health. So that includes examining the factors that are driving national and international health inequality, thinking about health behaviors and disease burdens and income inequality and transfer policy, and trying to use this research to guide policymakers in terms of what interventions are likely to reduce inequalities in health and longevity. So going from this descriptive work into some of the more causal stories. Um, a second domain, which I've already previewed, is understanding the relationship between income and race or ethnicity in health inequality. So using this linkage to census records with self-reported race and education to try to understand the sources of progress or the lack of progress in closing gaps in the United States between racial and ethnic groups in health. And the third thing is studying the causal chains that connect income and health. So one example is linking welfare reforms and tax reforms with health data. So inpatient data, outpatient data, prescription drug data, to try to model these feedback dynamics, which is challenging. We've got this reverse causality, which is hard to unpack, but starting to unpack those feedback dynamics between health and income. And so those are some of the things I'm excited about uh, in the domain of health inequality and the research uh, on that subject. Also, when we were all introducing ourselves on the first day, told you another area I'm excited about is using continuous integration tools in research coding. And so, you know, to give you an example of this is not yet publicly available, but the work that I'm doing now looks a little bit different from the work that I've posted in 2016, where actually I can get um, I can get the code and the paper produced entirely in the cloud. So I go into GitHub, I go into GitHub Actions, which is a continuous integration and automation tool, which will you know open up, you tell it to run something, a server's running in the cloud that has access to your code base, you can give it access to your data, you can potentially run your code entirely in the cloud. And what that looks like is, you know, here, I have some instructions for my co-authors, click on the actions tab, click on the project build tab, click run workflow, and tell it which branch of the Git repository you want to use for the build, or you can leave it at the default, which is the main branch, tell it which pipeline you want to build, and then if you want to typeset the paper, select the document uh, to typeset, otherwise it'll just run the code without typesetting a paper, and it'll run, so um, it'll install. Here in my repository, I'm working in Stata, it'll install Stata and project and download uh, the raw data and run the project. And when it's done, it told me, hey, successfully generated the PDF. All the figures in that PDF were automatically generated by the code from the raw data and inserted into the PDF. All the tables were inserted into the PDF. All the numbers were inserted into the PDF. And that is not how we produced this 2016 paper with all the results I've shown you. This is not how I've produced any of my published papers yet. This is how I'm working on my work in progress. And really, we're in the phase of sort of what software engineers call dog fooding this. We're eating our, the dog food we're producing. We are using it within our own lab, discovering the bugs, discovering the things that make it hard for the research assistants to work with, and refining this process. But my goal is to get this to a point where it's not only useful within our lab, but actually polished enough that it can be useful to others as well. And so like the final future direction in terms of uh, automated builds and typesetting is actually like writing this paper, which I've outlined, where I'm sort of making, you don't have time to read the abstract, I want to keep us on schedule, but I'm actually trying to pitch this to people who are different from you, 
who don't intrinsically care about reproducibility, who um, are really responding to the incentives of our, of our profession, which are largely about research productivity, not research reproducibility. And so the claim I'm making is that if we have the right tools, we can avoid the painstaking effort of wondering why has the number changed, wondering why this code runs on you know, my, my co-author's laptop, but not on my laptop. Um, and then that work of every time you change something, updating, manually updating all the numbers in your LaTeX document, like that is a lot of hours that are not very productive. In fact, not productive at all. And so the claim that I want to make and want to actually, I think it requires quite a bit of work to succeed at, um, but the claim is that there isn't, doesn't need to be a trade-off between productivity and reproducibility. That like, if we can leverage the right toolkit, we can both be more productive while producing more reproducible research. And I'm not there yet. Like right now I'm spending a lot of time trying to build the tools that are useful both to me and to my co-authors such that actually the scales tip in the other direction where going forward is a bunch of upfront investment, but going forward, these tools will make it so that we're more productive and our research is reproducible from day one. Um, we're not there yet, but I am looking forward to both you know, finishing implementing this continuous integration pipeline in my own research and then writing the paper on how I did it uh, and making the accompanying GitHub repository available that shows people how we did it. So let me conclude with my best wishes for good luck in all of your research projects.